All right, let's get started here. Um, welcome, everybody. This is a session called Evaluate Compatibility in Windows 10 and Windows as a Service Using Telemetry Driven Insights. Quite a mouthful. I'll get to what this means. First question for the group, have you ever wondered why these speaker shirts are moisture wicking? Um, I unfortunately found out this morning we got stuck in Georgia traffic and I had like a 10 minute jog coming to this room. So apologies for the slightly late start. My name is Mark Limashevsky. I'm a program manager on the Windows compatibility team or fundamentals team. We're part of the fundamentals group. And I work on enterprise upgrades. Um, I joined Microsoft initially as a consultant in consulting services in Germany focusing on uh, Windows deployment. That's why I'm kind of curious to see who here is working on Windows deployments or Windows clients. Great, everybody. Um, who uses Config Manager? Two more. Um, who is currently deploying Windows 10 or working on Win 10 projects? And is anybody done already? All right. <laughs> it's, it's surprising. There are, a couple, there are a couple companies that have made great progress, but in reality, what we're seeing a lot is many people are currently evaluating Win 10 upgrades, and compatibility is always um, a very important topic. I think I'm going to start by sharing the good news about compatibility. Uh, we're getting some very good feedback. Top left number, obviously, we announced we had 400 million deployed seats overall, about 52 million seats in businesses. And the way we measure that is we look at what we call commercial machines, so stuff that is um, licensed through volume licensing. And we're getting some really good feedback here from the press about compatibility in, in Windows 10. And there's somebody working on the compatibility team. I'm actually pretty glad to say that doesn't surprise us. That's not by accident. That's by design. And, and here's the reason why that is. So basically, since the development of Windows 10, compatibility has been a major design criteria. Um, in, starting in Windows 7, basically, there was a process that we called the Tenet process, little in Turner here, um, which means we had a team that was reviewing the state of compatibility all the time. We do a lot of testing, both manual and automated. And whenever we find compatibility bugs, meaning third-party apps or drivers not working, that is pretty much a ship stopper until it gets resolved. Um, the other thing that really helps us is that in the Win32 ecosystem, the amount of changes has been limited. There's a lot of stuff going on under the hood, but that's what the compatibility team is working on, on mitigating potential compat issues or changes in behaviors of APIs on the OS level rather than uh, mitigating that on the um, application level. And then the other thing is we have really good compatibility um, with um, both devices, meaning computers, because we wanted to enable the seamless upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10 on the same device in place pretty much. And on the, on the website front, it's similar. IE 11 ships as a compatibility technology. It is pretty much unchanged. A couple security fixes went in. But it's basically still the same browser. So IE 11 is the strategy for legacy applications. And then obviously, if you have more modern applications on the web, those would uh, find a home in Edge. Hardware side, uh, side as the slide mentioned, um, no change in system requirements, basically, um, since Windows 7. And we did a pretty good job working with um, OEMs and, and independent hardware vendors to make sure that we have great driver coverage on Windows Update, which is granted mainly a consumer story, but as an enterprise, you benefit from that as well. I'll get into details a little bit. The other thing, since we have Windows as a service here in the session title, I wanted to talk a little bit about Windows as a service, the new approach of developing and shipping Windows, and what that means for compatibility. Um, who here is familiar with Windows as a service and how the ship cadence is working? OK, good portion of the room. Um, I'll, I'll reiterate anyways. Um, the, the development model has, has changed. And there's a very interesting session uh, happened on Monday um, from, from the Windows Insider's perspective, where they said Windows 10 is actually the operating system where we shipped our code out the earliest. If you look at Windows 7, for example, there was like a three-year development cycle. And after that, there was a beta 1, and then a beta 2, and then the final product came out. And what that means is you, you only get very limited coverage. Um, for Windows 10, we actually started in 
October 2014, I believe, with the first preview. I believe we called it a technical preview. And we sent that out to insiders. And this insider population has steadily increased. Um, and what that gives us from a compatibility perspective is we see a lot of machines with software and hardware combinations that we do not have in our labs. And we take the feedback from the insiders basically on two levels. One level is direct feedback through the feedback hub. Um, the other level is telemetry-driven feedback. And, and we make Windows better. Making Windows better uh, has several, several implications. I mean, one of them is obviously addressing the verbatim feedback where somebody says this application doesn't work. Um, and then we go in, mitigate that, and, and validate. Um, the other thing that we do, though, is by getting this, this insider feedback and the telemetry from them, we can build better application lists that we go and test. We can work with ISVs before we ship a final product, and we, we just get to a very good compatibility experience. And this is needed because if you look at the um, Windows as a service timeline here, or the cadence, and you see that we basically ship about two releases a year. And the way that works is you have this gray phase, the feedback phase, basically, where you work with insiders on issues. Um, then this blue phase that says pilot is actually the date when we make a version of Windows available to the general public to test. Um, at that point in time, we recommend uh, enterprise customers to go into a pilot phase. So that lasts about four months. And during those four months, we continue to take feedback and make the product better. And then at one point in time, about four months after the initial shipment of a release, we declare a current branch for business, meaning ready for prime time in the enterprise. And by then, um, especially enterprise ISVs, um, security vendors, for example, have actually also updated their enterprise uh, software. You see that with antivirus software very often. So this is what it looks like if you, if you put it in perspective. Basically, the goal is to ship about two releases a year. And um, since the bits don't change a lot between this pilot and production phase in the enterprise, that's actually a great time for you to do a pilot deployment and validate if everything works uh, in, in your company as well. And the way of validating that, we, we like to call that a risk-balanced approach to compatibility. Obviously, the frequency of shipping is increasing quite a bit, right, from every three to five years to twice a year. And we heard that, especially for the Windows XP to Windows 7 migration, there was a huge test project that started before the migration even started. And very often, what actually ended up happening was people started testing. And by the time they got to production rollout, the test results had invalidated because things had changed. Um, and so that's why our recommendation for Windows 10 is to really think about um, a risk-balanced approach. And, and the way our team uh, thinks about risk balance is it's very important to have the right information to be able to determine what the potential risk is and then take decisions uh, based on that risk. So first step is obviously you want to have your application portfolio. And the important point about that is you want to have it in a way um, that it's easily maintained. Our approach for that is you update it constantly. It's typically not helpful to make this, hey, let's discover every application in our company effort where you send email to everybody or every potential application owner and ask them. Uh, we're recommending a more inventory, system inventory driven way, and I'll get into that in a second. Next step would be on an ongoing basis, you would like to prioritize uh, what's business critical, managed, which apps you don't support probably as an IT department. You also want to be aware of apps that you probably block. And then based on, on this determination, you actually define what kind of validation or testing you do. So for business critical software, you might actually go and run a full test pass. You want your application owners to sign off, et cetera. You probably have um, automated tests that you run from your, if you, if you have in-house developed software. But then on the other hand, if you have an application that you just support on best effort level, and it's not installed on many machines, maybe you want to take the approach of saying, okay, I can remediate this if I hit an issue, knowing that compatibility is very high in the operating system. Or maybe I want to know a support statement from the vendor, or maybe I want to know um, what the installed base of this application is in, on the given Windows 10 build that you're deploying. And then obviously, last recommendation is you can do a pilot-driven deployment, identify machines or users that are using certain applications, and basically test it in production. And this all sounds super exciting on paper, 
what we found is it's actually pretty hard to get tooling to walk you through this process. And that's what my team has been working on for about the last year, year and a half. And we built a service that we call Upgrade Analytics. Um, Upgrade Analytics is using telemetry information or opt-in data from, from enterprises, once you opt in, to create the inventory. And from there on, we basically try to tell you, as a customer, everything that we know about compatibility for your machines, for your applications, and for your drivers. So there is a database that we maintain with um, known application issues. We give you all of that information before you even start the upgrade process. Um, same thing for drivers. And we're starting to pull in more and more other data sources that help you reason over this. Um, I don't want to spend too much time actually looking at this slide. I would rather get into um, a little bit of a live demo. And if there are questions along the way, um, please stand up, let me know, I'll try to address. Since we're a little short in time, I might have to cut this off and move forward, and I'll be around after the session to answer questions as well. So pretty much what you see here is an OMS operations management suite workspace that has our upgrade analytics uh, solution deployed. I'll use this one here, the one titled Ignite. We made a couple of changes last night to light up new functionality. Um, so I'll use the Ignite, my, my, my preview workspace here. Um, but this is available to enterprise customers right now. And it's actually available free of charge. The way it works is you have to sign up for an OMS workspace, which requires an Azure subscription. But OMS is licensed for practical purposes based on usage. And the usage is measured by the amount of data that get, gets pulled in. And for data that comes in for upgrade analytics, we actually have an agreement with the OMS team to opt that out from billing. So using a free account gets you all the upgrade analytics features. I'll go in here, and, and basically what you see is, rather than uh, showing you an inventory, what is what we did in the past, we actually put all the information about compatibility in what we call a workflow. Um, here, this, this blue item that you see, we call it an information blade. This divides the workflow in several steps that make sense to do together. And, and then these steps have different data that's backing these steps. We can scroll through here. It starts with preparing an environment, goes through Resolving issues, which is basically reason to your applications, figure out what you need to test. Finally, you get to a deploy stage where you can export what you learned through the upgrade analytics tool into your deployment system. And then this is pretty new. We also give you information about um, IE sites. It's very similar to the site discovery toolkit that has shipped before. The new thing that we're doing is we're pulling the data into upgrade analytics, so you don't need to set up on-premise service, et cetera. You just um, get the insights in this tool. First question that typically happens is, how do I get my machines into upgrade analytics? Is there an agent? What kind of setup do I need to do? And, and the answer is, um, for upgrade analytics, we leverage an operating system component in order to uh, create the application inventory and to determine the compatibility information. It's, it's two components. I'm going to name the internal names here. We'll probably come up with better external names. We have one component that's called Appraiser. It's basically a tool that goes through and generates your inventory. We have another component that we call the Compatibility Database, or we sometimes just call it SDB internally. Uh, that's a database that tells us about the known issues. And we edit this database, and we basically update it once a month or more often. So these two components play in tandem. Important to know is also that the appraiser component is the component that runs when you run Windows setup. It's the same component doing the compatibility check there and an upgrade analytics. So you get the same kind of data into the tool here. Um, the way appraiser ships is actually through a recommended KB update. So many of you might have already picked that up. And in order to get the data in here, you just need to do configuration. Configuration is basically done through a registry key. And uh, what this registry does is it, it, it tells us which computers uh, belong to your organization. We call that key a commercial ID, and we generate that here in OMS. So it's, it's just a simple GUID. You get to regenerate this whenever you like, 
and this allows us to map data that belongs to your company to a given OMS workspace without knowing who you are as a company. We know this group of machines goes into this workspace, but we don't maintain um, a good mapping between this commercial ID belongs to this company. Obviously, sometimes we make a note of a commercial ID when we're working deeply with a customer or we're debugging issues, but it's designed in such a way that there is no easy way to correlate these two. Um, and the way the data is protected internally in Microsoft is only the Windows team has access to it and obviously our tools that are pushing it into OMS. Um, you take this commercial ID and we have a little script um, that you can, can run on your clients um, to deploy that. Let's just see if my demo is working here. It's probably the most involved demo that you'll see in, at all of Ignite. Um, you can download this set of scripts uh, from our website or from our blog. Our blog is aka.ms slash upgrade analytics, and we keep updating that content. Basically, we make two permutations of this little script. Uh, one of that we call the pilot script. You see there's a di diagnostics folder. This diagnostics folder does a lot of things. Um, it checks whether your network connectivity to Microsoft services is OK. Um, and, and it does a couple other things that allow us to troubleshoot. So we'll probably ask you to turn that on. Um, the magic is happening in, in the two scripts here. One's to run config.bat, just a simple batch file. And what you do is you do some configuration. You can configure a log path. You put in your commercial ID, and once you do that, you're pretty much good to go. Also include some configuration for Internet Explorer, data flow, et cetera. Um, and then once you've done that, uh, you can actually just uh, kick it off from an administrative command prompt. It will automatically PS exec into a system session, so we mimic what you do with SCCM, and it will give you some debug information on screen and in a log folder. Um, You'll also notice it's a second folder in here. It's called deployment, and it only contains these two script files, run config and an actual PowerShell script that does the work. And the beauty of this is this, these two scripts are only 25 kilobytes. They generate um, exit codes that we've documented on the blog, so you can use SCCM to deploy that, and you know what the state of your machines is, whether they have um, reported data or not. And this is the script you do use for initial setup to make sure you have all the KBs installed. And this is also the script that you're going to run um, when you want to kick off a data collection again. So the way this works is basically our agent runs once, and then it remains silent until you kick it again. The reason for that is we want to give IT pros the opportunity to, um, to control when the data collection is happening. So if you don't want it to collect, you have your data in once, that's OK. If you want to do a collection every week or every month, that's OK as well. And it depends on many factors, obviously, like network connectivity of your clients and your business requirements. So this is the idea. We understand it's not the perfect solution yet. We would like to see some better scheduling. But for right now, this seems to be pretty viable, so it, it gets you going. So once the script has run, it takes about 48 hours to get the data in our system. Part of the reason is that we go through several systems at, at Microsoft where data gets cooked, analyzed, and transformed, and then we move it over into OMS. Working on reducing that time, but after about two days, you should start seeing machines coming in. And what we're looking at here is a set of machines that's running in Microsoft IT. Those are basically the machines that are still on down-level operating systems, anything before Windows 10. And you see what we're detecting here is 13,000 computers. Out of these 13,000 that were initially detected, five have upgraded. The reason for that is these machines are basically machines used by Microsoft support to support customers with, with cases on down-level OSs. So we don't expect a large number here. We do have another workspace with all the Windows 10 machines as well. And then the first insight that we give you here is um, the, the pilot insight. So when you want to run a pilot, the question is which machines are actually good candidates to run a pilot on? And doing this here, we, we just pull out 
all of the machines that have no known issues according to Microsoft. So in the end user ecosystem, we would say these are good to go, you can go and, and upgrade them. What's interesting is you get to actually drill through the actual data. And, and now you're dropping into the OMS experience, which is basically a search engine based on log files, which is what we emit into the system. And you can drill through and just say, OK, I want to look at all my Windows 7 uh, systems here that would be ready for a pilot. And you get some basic information about the machines, like uh, the manufacturer, the build they're running, et cetera. And you can actually even um, drill through and see, OK, this specific machine has one driver issue. Let's take a look at what that is. And we see here's the Hyper-V video driver. And this gets replaced with a new version inbox, so you're good to go to actually upgrade this machine. So that's the level of insight that we show in the pilot phase. Next step we would then go through is you would uh, define your strategy of which applications do you want to look at. On these 13,000 machines in MSIT, we actually already see 54,000 unique applications, very daunting number. But what we do is we actually mark um, certain applications, about 53,000 of those, as low install count, meaning they're deployed on less than 2% of that fleet. So we say, OK, these, these ones you probably don't want to bother with because they are there. We acknowledge they are there, but they are probably not your prime target. Everything else, you can go through a review flow here. I'll give you a list of apps, either in table format or in a list format. And we give you certain information. The table is a little easier to see here. So we can tell you the install base. We can tell you the monthly active computers. A monthly active computer is basically a device that's running the app at least once in a month. So we, we have a usage statistic in here. Um, hmm? Is that a little, little easier to see? And then we also give you information about the issues that we have. And another point that we put in here is um, a link to a portal that we call Ready for Windows. I'll just click this. Um, Ready for Windows is a portal that we created to allow ISVs to um, put support statements in. And even if we don't have support statements, like we don't for this Windows firewall config provider, uh, we can tell you how often we see this certain application in the commercial ecosystem. And you can see one version of this is currently highly adopted. That means running on at least 100,000 commercial systems. The other one is adopted, so at least 10,000 commercial systems. So this gives you an additional indication um, to the known issues that we already flag about how compatible this app might be. So, question over there, could you? So the question is, how do we validate when vendors put a support statement in um, that they are really ready? And, and the example was in Windows 7, there were vendors that were requiring admin rights. Um, we basically take the support statement for the vendor and we give them a list of criteria that they, that they should work through. There's another program we call the logo program where we do additional uh, scrutiny. But in general, this specific case here where they require UAC off or admin mode, we haven't seen in a long time. So we take their support statements, actually, and, and, and put them in here. And we link you to their support statements so you get to hold them accountable for that. That's, that's the current story. But it's a good piece of feedback. I'll, I'll take that back, and we'll see what we can do. OK, this was ready for Windows. Going back to, to upgrade analytics here, um, you, can, you can go ahead and and set for every application the importance, whether you want to look at it or not, and the upgrade decision, which is basically your decision over an application, whether you say, this is ready to go, issue or not, or this is not ready to go, or I still need to do some due diligence tasks. Okay, going back here. 
Another thing you get to go through, and in the interest of time and to make some time for questions, I'm not going to drill into that too much, is um, the, the workflow that you get for applications with known issues. I'll just pick one example here. We see 680 unique applications that have some kind of issue according to our SDB. Can go drill in here. Let's take a look at the ones that are not reviewed. And you see this you've probably seen already. Display link, something's going on. We could drill through the computers that have it. And you see this app is actually removed during upgrade due to compatibility reasons, no action required. The way this works is in the end user ecosystem, we'll just pick up a new display link driver from Windows Update. In the enterprise, for you guys, it's still interesting because probably you want to standardize on a certain version of display link. So you get to put that into your task sequence, software deployment, however you want to do it, and, and just fix that after the upgrade if you'd like. But in general, we don't, with this specific issue, we don't see um, a problem for the actual upgrade. In the end user ecosystem, we actually don't show this, applications that are seamlessly removed, but we made the decision that for commercial customers, it's actually a very important data point to have before you attempt an upgrade. So you get to reason through that. And then uh, even for drivers, we give you uh, a, similar, a similar kind of view where we basically tell you, okay, here are drivers that do not migrate to the new operating system. These we have on Windows Update. These we don't know where to get a driver, so that's a discussion that you get to have with your IHV. The majority of drivers is on Windows Update. The full disclosure is we obviously understand uh, for commercial deployments, you probably want OEM drivers, but at least having an inventory of the drivers that you need gives you a starting point to have the discussions with your OEMs and gives you a way to make sure you have the right drivers. And then finally, we get to this deploy phase um, where you can see on a per computer level whether you have reviewed everything that belongs to a computer. So if you have reviewed all your supported and business critical applications, if you reviewed all the drivers, then the computer is going to move into this ready to upgrade state here. And you get to see that as a list in the tool. with um, machine names. And here's the good news. Um, the config manager people told me that yesterday they released a new preview. Um, we worked with them and we built a connector. So we actually collect the SCCM client grid in our tool and they pull it back and they make the readiness state on a per computer level available as an attribute in SCCM under G system. So you can run a Wickel query, and you can build a collection and say, give me all of the machines that are ready to upgrade now. The other thing you actually also get to do is you can pull that into an SSRS report, and then you can say, hey, based on collection, which machines are ready, which machines are not ready. Um, I have a little bit of a future slide. We want to deepen that integration. But for right now, you can do deployment targeting, and you can do some readiness reporting as well. That's correct. So the question was about the data flow, how the SCCM connection works. And we push the data up into telemetry cloud and into Azure. We do our reasoning over that in OMS, and then SCCM pulls it out of the OMS workspace. Um, also, OMS, if you, if you look it up, this log search um, feature has certain public APIs. So if you want to come up with interesting scripting, then you can do that as well. Then I just wanted to briefly touch uh, on these site discovery features. Um, how many of you are familiar with IE compatibility and have worked to that? Okay, subset of the group. Basically, the idea is this hinges a little bit on the uh, document modes that the site is rendered in and on which ActiveX plugins get loaded. So IE site discovery actually tells you which doc mode a given URL is loaded in. Uh, and tells you which active access are loaded. And uh, you can run very interesting queries on this. For example, if you're using uh, enterprise mode IE, you can say, hey, which sites that are using ActiveX I actually didn't put into a compatibility mode, which sites in a certain zone do certain things. So you can drill through that data here using OMS. And the reason we put it here is um, we understand that IE upgrades are always um, a discussion whenever you do OS upgrades. Um, IE data here is a separate opt-in. 
So that means if you don't want to collect the IE data because you have privacy concerns about URLs being transmitted, you get to opt out of that. You can do your Win32 app compared only. Um, but if you have IE stuff to do, this may be a viable solution and a quicker solution than setting up site discovery on-prem, in quotes. So that's it um, for the demo. There's a lot more to show. As I said, I'll hang around for questions. Got some feedback so far. Uh, some companies are reasonably excited to pretty excited about this. We're working with our friends from Daimler. They are actually one of the largest customers in upgrade analytics right now with a subset of their fleet. Uh, and then Ryder has also uh, committed to using it to help drive their upgrade projects. Right now, what we're looking at, the official number is about 500 customers have subscribed to the service, some with very few machines, some with more machines. And, and we're seeing pretty good pickup on this. And I would say my, my personal ask is, if you're interested in evaluating this, please sign up early, get a couple of machines in. It allows us to learn how to best run the service. Because obviously, for us as a Windows team, we're not necessarily the team that's most used to running cloud services, so we're working on that as well. Get us data early, and that helps us make the product better. So from the, the, the question was, what percentage of the fleet do we see on average? Um, I, I don't have a percentage number ready for the customers that we have right now. The recommendation that we give is put as much of the fleet as you can into this because you want to be able to reason over the compared state of your machines, right? Quite frankly, right now, um, most of them are in pilot. We've seen up to 10, 15, 20,000 machines in there for, for the large customers. But many of them are saying they're willing to actually go and do a full deployment of this. And we're, we're well on track. It's just we, we made this available about eight weeks ago on 7.22 as a, as a public preview. And what we're seeing is it takes a while for KBs to trickle through. There's potential patch cycle implications, et cetera. So that's why we're seeing the pickup. But yeah, we get indications that many customers are willing to put it on the majority of the fleet. And it's a little different from the way we recommended doing it with application compatibility toolkit, where we said grab a sample. Here we're saying um, get us a representative picture of your company, if you can, every machine. Because that, in turn, also fuels insights like the ready for Windows, where we can tell you, hey, this is the state in the ecosystem. Wanted to talk just a little bit um, about futures here. Um, we're in public preview, and one of the reasons we have the preview tag on there is because we, we understand we're not, in quotes, feature complete. And then again, if you're running a service, you're never feature complete. So the way we drive development is um, massively through customer feedback. If you get on the service and you have a decent number of deployment and you need something, feel free to reach out to us through the blog. And, and we actually prioritize what we're building next based on the feedback and what customers are asking for. A big thing that we're hearing right now is um, that there is a need for integration with other data sources and databases. And the one thing that we're already taking is we want to pull in SCCM collection membership into the tool. So you get to filter your insights based on um, membership in a collection, and then you can say, hey, show me my HR collection and show me which applications are incompatible in that collection and what's the installed base. So that's already in flight and coming. Um, other features are we know that customers have databases that list their applications and application owners. Um, sometimes it's in Excel, sometimes it's in some kind of a database, a SQL, SharePoint. Um, people want to merge this data. We have one customer that we're currently working with as an example for us to figure out how we best build it. If there are other customers that are interested, then we'll look at all of these examples and try to build something that, that fits most of the use cases. Because it's, it's very hard to get to this one size fits all. So we want to see the case study, basically. Another thing people are asking for quite a bit, we did a, um, a focus group on Monday, is post-upgrade health. And there are certain insights that we can give. So for example, we can tell you whether a machine has upgraded or it hasn't upgraded, and that you could probably also do from SCCM. But we could potentially also mine telemetry that uh, setup itself gives us. So if setup failed for a reason that's mysterious to SCCM, we could probably get something there. 
Um, we could also look into, are all your drivers there, or do you see missing drivers on the other side? We could take a look at, are your applications still there? That's what we're thinking with post-upgrade insights. Um, currently doing the internal investigation work, basically, in terms of what's available to us and how can we best show this. Um, office plugin inventory is another thing people say, hey, OS upgrades often trigger Office upgrades. We want to know what's going on in terms of custom code in Office, working with the Office team on how to make that best happen. Uh, super open for input in terms of what's most useful. Currently, we're talking about mostly plugins. Um, and then as we go down the list, it gets a little more vague and a little more in the future. Um, one of them is the application validation and test support. Uh, the question is, can we help you with the testing workflow for applications? Can we do certain testing automated? One idea we're kicking around is we have a toolkit called the App Certification Toolkit, which is not a compatibility toolkit, but it can do automated install launch tests, and it could tell you whether you hit an exception when the application starts. So that may be a scenario where we say, hey, for these applications that are not that important, is an install launch test viable, and can we do something with it? Um, Next point is another thing that's really, really cool. For a number of years, we've actually collected information about um, which applications have what library and API dependencies. So on an API level, we can actually tell you this app is touching this API, and we can potentially even tell you this update is touching this API. So between that, you can get very interesting dependency mapping. Um, another thing very interesting is we could detect which framework an application is based on and bring that application, uh, that information in. So we can tell you, hey, this app was compiled against VB6, for example. Maybe this is something you want to look out for. And then the last point is uh, also talking to our friends on the service provider side, um, consulting companies, et cetera, and we want to see if we can integrate with their services. So that's also not out of the question. A couple other points, and we're getting close to the end of the session. Uh, some info about the Ready for Windows portal. You can just go to readyforwindows.com, type in an application name, and get support and adoption status for those. Um, we're constantly building and expanding that. And the data that we have in Upgrade Analytics is basically querying pretty much the live backend, so you get the latest and greatest. And by marrying this data with inventory, you actually get a much easier way of reasoning over that than manually trying to compare Excel files. Um, if you're an ISV or if you know ISVs, please tell them to go ahead and sign up. They get good resources on how to make their apps work really well. And by signing up and providing a support statement, it obviously makes your job a lot easier. Another uh, thing that we've created, um, mainly for service partners, is um, a two-day workshop called the Enterprise Compatibility Briefing. That's uh, Microsoft Consulting Services and our team working together. It's currently a two-day workshop um, talking about compatibility issues, classes about compatibility issues, and, and what you want to know about them. If you're a Microsoft partner helping customers upgrade, you can get that workshop through Accelerate. If you're a customer and you're working with a partner, then you can ask that partner to deliver that workshop to you. Currently, a two-day workshop. We're planning to expand that to a four-day workshop, which will also go into testing how to best structure test labs, that kind of thing. And then finally, you know, the call to action, Upgrade Analytics is in public preview, free, available today. If you go to this site, aka.ms slash Upgrade Analytics, you will hit our blog. And the way we typically drive it is we put a lot of technical content on the, do on the blog. We also have a TechNet site, but the blog is the most current thing. Whenever we see something, we'll post on the blog, and then you can just keep up with that. Um, please go and evaluate this early and give us feedback early. Our email addresses are in the blog. You can also use the Windows Feedback Hub under Windows Installation. We have a path called Upgrade Analytics for Enterprise. Give us that kind of feedback. If you're an ISV, get on the Ready for Windows portal or ask your ISVs to get on the portal. Um, Accelerate content is down here for the workshop. And then, you know, most importantly, keep the feedback coming and, and we'll address it as quickly as we can. The other thing that we're asking is please evaluate the session. Give us good grades or not so good grades. The more people evaluate these sessions, 
the easier it is for us to make the case that we want to come to more Ignites and conferences like that. So it's a very important data point for us to see if what we're doing is valuable. And with that, um, that's pretty much it. I believe we have another minute or two left, so if there are any questions, we can take them here. Do you want to use a microphone? So for internally developed apps, we currently detect them, and we allow you to put in a state as to whether they are ready or not, and we can consume this state. And then we're, we're working on, on the future story on what else could we do. Okay, and then another question is, you had said that all hardware that works with Windows 7 is compatible with Windows 10. Do you know why the hardware companies are publishing lists that do not include all-inclusive Windows 10, 7 compatible devices? It's, it's a loaded question. So from our perspective, we didn't change the hardware requirements, right? The other side of the story is for a hardware vendor, they always ask the question, is it worth to write a new driver for the new operating system? If they don't believe it's worth to write the driver or to test the driver, then they're on the safe side by saying, don't go. Um, from a compatibility perspective, there's always the other question. You know, the compatibility question we ask is, does it work? And in most cases, it does. There, there are edge cases. So please don't take this as a blanket statement of if it works on Windows 7, we'll guarantee it works. We cannot make that guarantee. But hardware requirements are the same. So same CPUs work, same amount of memory and disk works. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, if, if you want to grab a microphone, then I don't have to repeat. Actually, I believe a question more for, for the BitLocker team on our side. Okay. Um, I'll take it as a question. Let's exchange uh, contact information, and, and I'll, I'll forward that. OK. Uh, right now, we are using Windows 10 Enterprise, and we are on version 15.11. Mm -hmm. uh, to go to 16.07, uh, yeah. is that part of the Windows update, or how do we take that path? So there are, there are two ways to migrate once you're on Windows 10, right? You can still do the in-place upgrades using SCCM task sequence, or there's a new way of doing it. The SCCM guys call it a servicing plan, which is basically the Windows update-driven approach, where you don't get to write an entire task sequence. You just take the in-place upgrade. So well, those are. To get as part of the Windows 10 update, does it have to become a current, current business branch? As I mentioned before, we are on enterprise, and I don't want to go to this. 1607 until it becomes a current business bank. So how do I control? Okay, and, and in terms of when the update gets deployed? Yep. Well, there's always an action that you need to take in order to deploy that update, right? What's, what's the scenario? Are you, are you so I want to make sure that we follow this monthly update cycle for Windows patches. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to see 1607 as one of the monthly Windows patches. Yeah. No, it's, it's marked separately. It's a different update classification. It's called Feature Update in WSUS. Okay. And, and, and that's, that's the difference there. So it doesn't come in automatically. Great, thank you. Um, a couple questions. One with the upgrade analytics. Is there a way to identify applications and what their authentic code is? What their authentic, authentic code? You, earlier you mentioned the Windows logo program. And one of the requirements being there for all executables to have authentic code, is there a way to identify that within the upgrade analytics? We, we currently don't pull it in. Um, I would, be, would not be surprised if our inventory has it. I, I can follow up on that. So it would be, would be doable to pull that in with it in general if, if we see it on the client system. We don't have it in right now, but we can take that as a feature request. Um, the other one, kind of following back on the gentleman's question as far as the feature update, how long can you defer that feature update before it gets mandatory? For, for Windows as a service? Yes. Not the authority on, on answering that. I, I heard different, different things that came, came through, so. Yeah, and that's the same. We're hearing different things, too, so we're trying to see what the definitive answer is for 
how long it can be deferred. Is it 12 months? Is it going to be eight months? Yeah. At what point does support stop and you have to patch? Let's, let's exchange email. So from what I've heard and, and, and the latest statement that I've heard is whenever a feature update comes out, we always support two, two versions basically, right? So um, if, there's, if there's one CBB and the next one comes out, for that period in time, both are supported, and then when the next one comes out, the first one goes out of support from the, from the uh, feature update perspective. And I believe there's like a 60-day grace period. That's, that's the most current statement that I've heard. Okay, and uh, last question. You mentioned the update analytics in the roadmap is to have uh, application dependency uh, for .NET. Is part of that also identifying which .NET components are needed because now that there is that component, some of them are disabled by default? It could be. Um, this is, you know, these are, these are ideas that we're currently investigating. It's, it's not really a, a roadmap. We don't have the two-year plan mapped out, right? If there's something we can identify, we can make it part of the roadmap, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'm just interested in the purging of data for out-of-service devices and upgrade analytics, the process. Oh, for out-of-service devices, when does a machine disappear from upgrade something, analytics? Something like a a script you add to a, a, a task sequence or something that can, you know, you have a database or can you go over that for me real quick? The way we do it currently is um, we purge, I believe, after 90 days of not seeing data, and we do that in our back end. Um, if there's additional capabilities needed, um, let us know. The other thing that we're evaluating is whether we would give you a time window that you want to look at, and you can slide this time window and you can say, hey, I'm reasonably certain all the relevant machines have submitted data in the last 30 days, so only give me the last 30 days worth of data. Currently, we have, I believe, the 90-day purge. I work in a regulated industry, and I'm mm -hmm. curious about the telemetry and uh, what the scope of that data is and it's encrypted. Okay, so from a telemetry perspective, if you go to our blog and to the TechNet documentation, we actually do document all the data points um, that we're collecting for upgrade analytics, including the names of the data points and sample data. So you can use that to have a discussion with your security folks. What I would ask is, um, if there are data points where you have specific concerns, please give that as feedback to us, and then we'll see what kind of solution we can find. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Question regarding your uh, data set of no known issues. Mm -hmm. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean there's no data or that it's been tested? So no known issues means, means exactly that, right? We as a team are not aware of an issue. And, and I can only give you the definition of the inverse, right? How do we, I guess we probably have to go offline here in a second. Uh, the, the, the question is, how do we come to a known issue, right? And the data sources that we use for that is we, we test about 3,000 applications that are popular on our own. We get feedback from ISVs. They typically tell us when something doesn't work, and we take the insider feedback, right? And when we can repro that, that's a known issue. No known issue means through this process we haven't seen anything. So you actually, unfortunately, cannot go and say no known issues means there are no issues. It just means that we're not aware of it. But does it mean you, you've actually looked at it, or does it mean you may not have it currently means we may not have looked at it. One of the things that is in flight is we're actually seeing if we can publish the data of the testing that we do. So then you get the second piece of Microsoft looked at it and didn't see anything. But it's currently not in the tool. We're working on you know, what, what the framework is to make that available. Because obviously, whatever we do, we cannot take this support statement from the vendor, right? We can just say, okay, we looked at it and this is what we saw. Um, I believe we should probably take the, the mic offline and then I'll, I'll be around for, for your question as well. <laughs>